again and welcome to Man's Talk. I'm Tammy Simmons. And I'm Carla Garrick. And here we are in the middle of November. You know, there's only, what, six weeks left of this terrible, miserable year. Um, because, you know, when New Year's kicks in, everything gets better, right? <laughs> I mean, uh. there is that sort of mental break with a year. But I have to say, like, I, I you know, I'm one of those every day is a new day oh, kind know. of people. So after the election and all of that had passed, I was like, oh, what do I still want to do this year? And I was like, more yoga. Yeah. So explain this to me, Tammy. Don't ask me to explain yoga. So, (laughs) so I go to hot yoga, right? Okay. And, and, uh, so it's a 90 minute session in a 105 degree Fahrenheit room. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's hard. Right. And the older you get for me in any I don't even think I could gets... sit in a 105 degree room for 90 minutes. I mean, yeah, literally, it's, it's, I know my limitations. It, it has been an adjustment. I mean, I certainly I started like 20, 22 years ago, yeah. I used to do it very regularly. Now yeah, it was 20 or 22 years ago. <laughs> yeah, now, now I got back into yeah. it. And then COVID happened, the studio yeah, shut yeah. down, like all that stuff, right? So fine. So it was the first time I'd gone back since April. Yep. And I was really excited to see they were open, you know, and they made adjustments. They have a mask policy yeah. and everything. Okay, fine. Whatever. I right. get it. I get it, right? Like everyone's just right. complying with right. silly, dumb rules. Right, but if you want to go okay. and do the hot yoga and that, whatever. Right? So here's the part I do not understand. We are in a hot yoga studio. We're all six feet apart. Mm-hmm. Everyone, I went in, you know, without my mask. I lay on my mat. Everyone took their masks off. Fine. Now we do the yoga, right? 90 minutes, 105 degrees. Uh, You're hot. You're You're sweaty. sweaty. Most of it involves breathing. Like, you know, like breathing in, breathing out. Like, all right. When we were finished, I was knackered. Like, I literally could not stand up. So I'm lying in dead man's pose. But I got one eye open. Every and I laid closest to the door because I knew it was going to be hard. And at least when someone opens the door, you get a little bit of fresh air, right? So I got all the cheats down. Every single person in that room got up from their mat and put their put their mask on and walked out the studio. Now, I don't understand. I to me, that is genuinely unfathomable. Like it's it's irrational. Because here's the thing: I get. I've been feeling like I get in, not into arguments, but like trying to have rational discussions and Keith Murphy's in a lot of them. And there, there isn't rational there could, because I, I understand how the virus works. I was thinking about this as we were walking in today and I'm like, wait a minute. So, okay. When we shut things down in March or April, right? That's when we had no idea what was going on, no idea how to treat it, no idea what the repercussions were going to be, and we needed to not overwhelm the hospitals. In retrospect, fine, that was a thing. By June, that actually wasn't a thing. No, but let's. But but at that time, it was a thing. (laughs) Sure. By June, when it was warmer and everybody naturally is moving outdoors and doing more things, and your windows and your house are open, and all those things. We continued to keep things closed and continued to make it very difficult for people to function in their lives and businesses to function in their lives because I guess we were trying to slow the spread of COVID. But now, even though we did all those things and people were wearing masks and we did all those things, here we are in the middle of November and the COVID numbers are increasing because of course they're going to. It's flu season. Well, it's flu wouldn't season. It we're doing for, more testing. Right, that too. But I mean, wouldn't it have been better for people to get COVID when it wasn't flu season? When well, they? I mean, I think people have been getting it. If you look at any of the charts and if I, you can apply any form of logic or rationality, which by the way, can Seems I just to be say, a struggle. So I'm I'm uh, audiobook listening to uh, a bear walks into the woods, or a, it's some book that uh, a, a reporter from Vermont wrote about uh, Grafton, New Hampshire, oh. and the Freetown Project yeah. and whatever, right? So someone sent me the link. It's nine hours long. Really, kind of feels like it's two books. Like it's a book about bears and it's a book <laughs> about uh, this project, yeah. and they sort of mashed it together. It's interesting. It's well written. It's a yeah. good audiobook. I'm enjoying it so far. But one of the things in one of the chapters that the the uh, the reader says is he's like, libertarians are very rational and logical people. And so I was like, yep, that sounds right. But then he makes it sound like that's, that's bad. a bad thing. Yeah. So here's my question, and this is actually a genuine question to the world at large. 
So if you're going to make rules about stuff, should you make rational, logical rules about stuff so that, I don't know, it makes sense? That's what the words rational and logical mean. Or do you want to make rules that if they are not rational and logical, are thereby definitionally irrational and illogical and then expect people to, to follow. follow those because i think the disconnect that we are genuinely seeing in society is this notion that we're going to make irrational illogical rules which is telling someone to put on a mask at a hotel or at a restaurant door to what? walk to their table and then take it off and then take it off and then put it back on when you go to pee. That is irrational and illogical. And that is why people are not, just not, all frustrated right. and not following it and not, you know. And then on the flip side, if it's just an issue, which people have said to me a lot, just comply, Carla. Just comply. But what? And I'm like, but, you know, that's how bad things start to happen in life. When we do illogical, well, I mean, irrational I, I are... things and then tell everyone to just do it. Well, and I think you've, are, I mean, I just, I do feel like I'm seeing um, people not able to process, like, be a critical thinker. And I realize not everybody has critical thinking skills. But that's actually that's something that it. you develop. If right. we had a robust, good education right. system, you are taught to think <laughs> critically because that's actually what life is, right? So it's it's, funny. Life is a riddle and we can give you the tools to solve the right. riddle. So this kind of, ironically, this transitions into what I was thinking we'd probably end up spending most of our time talking about, the homeless camp, camp over near the courthouse. Um, Again, in these Facebook discussions. So there was an article, I think Manchester Ink Link, I know there was one in the Union Leader, but it, whatever one was on Facebook yesterday had pictures of these protesters holding signs and all these different pictures. And in the thread, there were people who were saying, um, you know, housing is a right and you don't understand, but it's not a right. And you don't understand because you're privileged, which made me Google, what exactly does privilege mean? Because maybe I'm misunderstanding a word that I thought I knew. No, privilege means you're giving special rules for you because you're privileged so i'm not well they probably also changed the definition i know of but i'm just saying but that's recently. what privilege really means so i'm not privileged because i can function on my own that doesn't make me privileged that makes me functioning well here's so so let's unpack some of that because i kind of feel sometimes people are just like they've been taught these things or they've been told these things and so they just believe them but let's unpack is housing a right? No. Okay, so let's start with what is a right? A right is something inalienable. Right. It is something you have when you are born that you have as a human being okay. that no one, including the government or a democracy or a group of people, can take from you. Some of those rights are things like a right to self-defense, which is how we get the Second Amendment. Yep. Love it, hate it, freedom whatever. Freedom of speech. That is a right. Freedom of speech. Freedom of conscience. Right. Like all of freedom these of things, right? You're, uh, you are allowed to, in America, believe what you want, say what you believe, and people should accept that. Those are the rules of this country. Somewhere along the line, We've in the last hundred things. years, pretty much when we socialized education and said, oh, there's only one message and we're going to teach everyone this one dumb thing that is incorrect. So now we have a generation of people who believe entirely Everything is a right. the wrong things, right? So how can housing be a right? Housing can only be a right if you personally believe the government owns you and owes you something. Right. So the question to these people are, are you a free human being or are you a slave of the government? And maybe some folks want to decide that they are They're a slave. slave of the government, that they are owned by the government. I'm not down with that. But if you want to be down with that, then you have to understand. And, and then we need to, to look. That. Yeah. So if you are not a free person, and if you think you have a right to housing, that you have a right to demand that I must pay for where you want to live, then, I mean, personally, I think we have a problem. But then I don't think, personally, 
you should have the right to vote. Say. Right, because you're giving so, up, you're, you're trading things. So if you, yeah. So, so with these guys, you know, I saw the protests. Look, and don't get me wrong, my heart bleeds for these people. Oh, my heart you know bleeds what? for some of them. You I'm sorry, I no longer. You can't fix a problem by going, I'm going to come here and fix this. Yep. If you're a junkie or unemployed or hurt or traumatized, whatever the reason is, nothing Lazy. from here. Sorry. Sure, what, whatever the reason is, but nothing from here Solves can that. fix this. Right, you have to fix Until you this. decide, I am going well, to fix it. So this one woman, and I, I won't mention names, but this one woman who I see in conversation all the time, she's posting about how terrible it is and how, we're, how privileged people are who don't understand the situation that these poor people living in somebody else's property and making a mess of it are doing. And somehow it circled back to the COVID conversation. And at one point, somebody said... She was saying, um, actually, maybe it was two different threads that I was following at the same time. This same person who was over here talking about the homeless people also said, well, we have to stop this virus. And if that means shutting things down, that's fine. But what the government should do is there should be a federal mask mandate. Yeah. And if, if there is a mask and if you won't wear a mask, you can be fined. And it was too easy. So I went over to the other thread that she was in and copied the pictures of the protesters and the homeless people and brought them over to this thread and said, are these the people who aren't wearing masks are we that you find want them? to find? And how is this enforceable? How exactly would that work? She didn't respond. Of course because not. once you, then it's like, well, that doesn't work. Um, but I did make me think about, because most of those people, a lot of the people, not just the homeless, the protesters didn't have masks on, which I thought, okay, I'm sorry. I thought you were all the mask people. But it got me to thinking about like, how do we actually, um, I don't, there's ways to prevent additional homeless coming here, but there's things, how does our community resolve hundreds of people that are living on public property or on private property or breaking into houses that people own like happened in my life? Um, so I was like, well, I do think it comes down to personal responsibility. You know, I you read and you hear, well, these people can't get a job because they don't have a permanent address or they don't they're not clean or they don't have clean clothes or whatever i will tell you based on the people that were living in my house after they broke in that one they are not clean at all these people that were in my home were filthy disgusting pigs for lack of a better word i mean and i i have and, to say i check in with the homeless on, on and the it's not everybody. river park and you know I, it start it one, starts simple and then, and it, then it starts it just, to grow and next thing you know there's socks in the ground and there's shirts in the trees and you're like what is this? And what was and, it with that one right. damn sock yeah, in my always, house? <laughs> and, right, that's how it was. In, my whole house was like that. Oh. There, there was just randomness and chaos. And so let's say we took the police station that's right there in that same corner and we outfitted it for uh, transitional housing. And I how about we not anything? Right. How about those people? Well, I mean, somebody would have to decide that they right. could actually use the property. But somehow some entity, not my tax dollars, hopefully, but some entity retrofitted that building for X number of beds. They'd probably be bunk beds. They might not be super private. That's too bad. You're living in the lawn. You can't, you know, this is life. I mean, I'm pretty sure it's a jail with a whole bunch of cells. Right. So, I mean, so, all of it's there already, you right? Could, <laughs> you could move people. You could give people the option of moving from the lawn into the building where there are showers. Which is literally across, across the street. Right. So I mean, it could also go to the Sununu Youth uh, Center, which I, is almost entirely why, empty. Right, but the problem is, is that filth will destroy that property and we'll have to pay for it again. So I think that's the real reason. I mean, and the fact that it's in the North End and they're not gonna tell her. Well, but exactly. See, but yeah. here's what I would like to see. How about, you know, if you're a, you know, a nice privileged socialist there in the North End, take which home is- with you. Why not? Those protesters, why they don't were, they that's what, take one there home? There was a lot of comment on the, the thread from right? a lot Solve of people the problem saying, for your own human instead action. of standing there with a sign about the plight of the people that you think need our help, take one of those people and their tent and put it in your backyard and resolve a problem for one of those people. And so I, I, I remember I saw a debate once at a very, you know, it was a Tony University somewhere in America, and I think it was Dinesh, 
Dinesh 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 I was watching him gave, the other night. Gave a, uh, was giving a lecture and, you know, some kid who had been clearly trained in Marxism and neo-Marxism, having gone through the entire American education system, you know, got up and he was like, you're, you know, you're, it's white privilege, you He's know, we white. should, you know, make these, <laughs> right, but he was actually, I mean, he was almost indicting his own university yeah. in this, like, speech. And then Dinesh D'Souza goes, you, give up your slot. Yeah. Why don't you leave this Ivy League school? And let somebody else come. And go find someone that you feel has been, you know, really traumatized or, like, hurt or institutional, right. whatever, or, like, whatever, you know, all the languages that we like to use to confuse people about what's really going on. Give your slot to someone else. But, 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 and the kid looks so... Like what? Like not my wh spot. What? No, I just want to generally say we should do these things. I don't want to do any of this. And so that, again, is one of those teachable moments where you could go, well, if you're not willing to why do should it I? yourself, why, why do you want to force society, people, which is what us. is society, but individuals... Right? Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing as we had another police shooting this weekend. So yeah, there are two in the past the month. That one. You know, shot in the chest. Yep. Apparently, no warning. I mean, it was in today's paper. Of course, we don't know what happened because yeah. they won't tell us. We don't know who did it because they won't tell us. But, you know, trust the system. I know. Guys. Um, I did read in the Sunday paper on the homeless and the housing shortage and whatever. You know, here's the thing about housing shortage and rents and everything. If, if you can't live, I grew, I grew up in upstate New York. I left upstate New York and moved to New Hampshire, not because of pretty trees and mountains, because I had pretty trees and mountains in upstate New York, but because I, there were no good paying jobs in New York. It was very difficult to find employment. So I moved a couple states away that I had never been to before in my life before I came here to find better opportunity. I moved to where the jobs were, where I could have build a life. Um, and I think sometimes people have to realize that if you're living in New Hampshire and you, I, I, first of all, I never, when I moved here, um, I didn't work one job. I, so I, when people say you don't understand, no, actually I do understand. I worked a job and a half. I was married at the time. My, my ex-husband worked a job and a half. We had one vehicle between us we made it work. Yes. I lived in Hookset. I worked in Bedford in Manchester. Like yeah. it wasn't like I walked next door to work. I had to figure out a way to get from point A to point B. I had a lot of things to shuffle and make my life work. It wasn't always easy. It wasn't always glamorous, but you figure it out. So the housing shortage, you know, sometimes people have to accept the fact that you might have to work two jobs to be able to pay rent. You might have to get a roommate and live in a small, tiny apartment where, you know, your bedroom's in the living room. There's lots of bad things. Okay, but also two things. One is, let's ask, why is things, well, why are things yeah. getting so expensive? Because we're putting it's all sorts of- It's the government's of fault. Yeah. It is your socialistic programs yeah. that cause these yep. things to go up. If you pretend like everyone owns everyone's property, which is what zoning is, and you go, you're not allowed to build a granny flat or you're not allowed to do this, then what do you do? You reduce the supply. Yep. When you have less supply, price goes yep. up. It's like none of this is magic. It's just that government wants to run and people want to come up with policy positions and the way the world should work while 100% ignoring yep. economics. So I saw, oh, sorry. And it can't. It can't it work doesn't, like right. that. So, so housing is expensive because of too much government intervention. If we reduce zoning and let people do with their property what they want because it is their property, that is what property rights means, that pricing will come down. If we stop writing millions and millions of regulations about every aspect of people's yep. homes from what is Everything. in the paint oh, it's insane. to how much water is allowed to come out of your faucet. Or how much <laughs> must come out of your faucet. So I did see a thing in, the, in Sunday's paper, because I still haven't canceled my subscription, um, about how one of, the, how one of the nursing homes, I think, out in Dover um, bought some property. The owners of this facility decide they had a, a piece of land that they were going to build, you know, like $350,000 homes on, mm -hmm. but realized for their business, it would actually benefit them more to build 40 small one bedroom cottages for their employees. So I read that yesterday, right? The, on Sunday? Yeah. 
And I was like, huh, huh. I wonder how long that brilliant well, plan's going to last, last before, before zoning. the zoning people well, come in and go, no, you can't do this. Because right. there are several examples I know. from other states where people literally in California tried to solve. L.A. has a awful homeless problem yeah. and someone bought land yep. put tiny homes on it gave it to homeless people to live in and the city came and, and said no 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 chased the homeless well, people out of the houses and demolished the tiny homes. so i did i did find it interesting they're small they're 384 square feet um they originally were going to build 13 3,000 square foot homes now they want to build 40 of these uh, and i agree I bet it turns into a nightmare for these developers. Poor but, people, but it yeah. is the right concept. This is very similar to what the mill was like. The mills, they built the mills, and then all these brick houses in the mill yard, guess what? Those didn't just randomly pop up. Those were built by the mills for people who worked in the mills. Right. A lot of the houses on the west side of Manchester that look very similar to the mm -hmm. other four houses on the street, that's because somebody built them because people needed to live in housing. Um, this is an. This just to me was a very interesting, like nice to see that maybe somebody's I, I trying to do it. Because it. if it works in one place, I mean, you look at manufacturing jobs, and this is the p problem that you have. It. it. This isn't really about homeless, although it would free up other apartments for them. But the problem is, is that you've got um, people working in certain industries, and uh, we know that um, assisted living facilities is one of them that they don't pay a fortune. Um, and they need those people to be happy in their lives so that they stay in those jobs. I'm sure we see it similar in like if they open an Amazon warehouse that there would be similar things. You know, those aren't necessarily going to be, you know, $30 an hour jobs. Um, I'm sure near any manufacturing facility, there is some sort of need for housing for that workforce. Imagine if, I mean, it wouldn't probably work in Manchester because there aren't big plots of land all sorts of places. But I mean, in surrounding towns in Londonderry, where there's a lot of manufacturing and a lot of things, there is land. And it would be interesting because if you can take those working people who can't afford $1,600 a month rent, but can't afford a very small place for $900 or $1,000 a month, they're now out of the $1,600, which means the person who's living in the $800 place who can afford a 16 can move over. And then the, the lower income places become available and if we remove some of the restrictions as to how many unrelated people can live in an apartment together because I'm pretty sure Manchester has an ordinance that limits how many non-related people can actually which is, live together. Which is because, just Because you know that's important. Silly. I mean it's just you know you go and you look at these ordinances and you look at the stuff and there's just so much nonsense because every time we try and solve a problem we, we create a hundred new ones we do and and you know just to go back to that sort of um market notion right right so you had mentioned yes the old mill buildings where they they you know yep. uh, had the housing and whatever they you know that used to be the affordable workforce housing yep. right now those are some of the nice nicest, houses right. i mean i know in portsmouth i actually went to oh, look at one to... there's like a little neighborhood where i think it was old navy houses yep. like these little brick navy houses and it was um you know, now they're like six hundred thousand right. dollars or well, something. I mean, I'm sure the why ones... because the market shifts, right? right. Because right. you can't all That's my you can't there. all um, <laughs> uh, you know I, we're not all the same. No, and I mean, d d here's my question too. So does everyone have to be? It's like, not the same. So, so going back to that notion of privilege, right? So the beauty of the American system is that we have a system of equal opportunity. You can never have a system of equal, equal outcome. outcome. Ask China. Ask yeah. Russia. It's not possible. And basically, when you try and get to some kind of equal outcome, you end up having to murder a lot of your citizens to kind of get there. So how about we not do that? Here is the rea reality <laughs> is as long as we have a level playing field, right? right? So everyone has- an So that nobody has privilege. Yes, because here's the other thing, right? So, and and I'll probably get dinged for this, but I'm like, yeah. I, I, I don't really believe in the concept of white privilege. I think it's a neo-Marxist term that people throw around that uh, manipulates groups of people to act in certain ways, right? But let's say there is white privilege. Let's say it's the legal system of equal opportunity. Then I'm like, 
I want everyone to have white privilege. Right. That is actually the system we currently have, right? You have equal opportunity to get where you want. I moved to America with right. seven thousand dollars and a suitcase. Right. Well, that's what I'm saying. When people, you know, I mean, you don't live. You, our lives right now are are comfortable. We live in nice homes. We work hard. We do our things. Um, I'm not 20 years old. I didn't have this same I life. Mean, but when I was, and I was in law yeah. school, I was working two jobs. I was, and, you know. Like, and you decided that you wanted to change your life, and you won a lottery. And like you said, with $7,000 that you worked very hard to accumulate. Oh, my God, that was all the money I had. Yeah. <laughs> with his luggage. And next thing you know, look, you know, and it takes time. And when you first moved to New Hampshire, you might not have, you didn't live in the house that you currently I live did in not. by any means. <laughs> when I first lived in New Hampshire, I did not live in the house. I lived for 20 years on Parker Street. I loved my house. Um, the next people that own my house at some point, I hope they love it as much <laughs> as I do. Or, you know, I lived there and thought that's as far as I would ever be able to progress, that that was it. But I was okay because I had a beautiful yard and my little house, and I'm going to live here happily ever after, forever and ever. Amen. And now I'm in a different place because. Dan and I work very hard. Dan works way harder than I do. Dan makes very good money, and he provides a very nice life for us. Could that change? Of course. Do we have a plan? Yes. Do we get up in the morning and execute the plan? Yes. We don't just get up in the morning and go, I think we'll just play a board game for the I, next I, five days. I think I have the right to your labor. Carla, could you bring me food? Right? Just bring me food, because I'm busy playing this board game over here. So, we're not going to solve the world's no. problems uh, today, but you will be on holiday. I will be away. For two weeks? Am ten I doing days. Ten, ten days. days? So, do I do one show on my you own? You have to do two shows on your own. Two shows on so my own. I'm going to find a guest. Find a guest. Um, I'll be back on the... I'll, be I'll back. read you guys stories from my book I'll be that back. everyone should buy. I'll be back and able to do the show the following. But I'll be back. She'll be 10 and know, I'll to, be bitter. Because I'm pretty sure I have to quarantine, right? <laughs> Ooh, I'll let you sit next I'm to not me telling with your anybody. Cuties. I'm not telling anybody where I'm going, when I'm going, when I'm coming back. How do you like that? So uh, that's all I got. Um, yeah, I'm taking a vacation. We're taking I, a much needed vacation, and I would encourage you, everybody to do the same. And we're we're spending uh, Thanksgiving with some friends that we have never met in person. Um, one of Dan's coworkers has invited us to have Thanksgiving with them indoors, crazy land with other adults. Um, so we're going to do that and I'm going to relax and Carla's going to take care of my pooch and Jenny, will live. Jenny, yeah. and Jenny and Nellie will have a grand old time while we're away. And that's all we got. Take care guys. See ya. Bye.